Okay, great. Um, it seems like we're uh, ready to start with um, our next session. So we have a lineup of three um, exciting talks for today. Uh, so same as yesterday and just before, if you have uh, questions throughout the talks, uh, which will be 30 minutes each, you can put them in the chat and then I can read them out um, at the end of the session. Or uh, of course, you can virtually raise your hand at the end of the session and ask your question. Um, so um, I think we're uh, ready to start with our first speaker, uh, Gozdem Arikan from the University of East Anglia, uh, with the talk title, Action Speaks Louder Than Words and Gaze, The Relative Importance of Modalities and Didactic Reference. Um, so with that, um, take it away. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, can I now share screen, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Bear with me. Yes, so thanks for the introduction, Eva. So as mentioned today, uh, my talk is on like the multimodal characteristics of like the communication together with myself, Peter Body and Kenny Coventry. We worked on this project throughout last year. And this is my first time presenting this work or any work from my PhD. So I hope you guys find it as interesting as we do. Um, Okay, let's we'll start off. In our everyday lives, we use different types of tools to communicate with each other. We use words, we use gestures, we use eye gaze, and these happen automatically and synchronously, simultaneously across different cultures. Um, one of the means of communication, which is fundamentally multimodal, is that the communication. And it entails the use of language, with words such as this and that, we call them special demonstratives, um, gestures such as a pointing arm, eye gaze, uh, in order to draw attention of people to a specific position in space. And the language element, as I mentioned just now, can include words such as this and that, here and there, and gestures can be in many different forms. And the eye gaze is there throughout the conversation and it can also be used for an establishing attention to see if the person we are engaging with is receiving our message. But we'll touch upon this again briefly shortly. And as in this image, people use, um, oops, I did something. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. Can you still see the page, right? Yeah, I, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> All right. Um, as in this image, people use gestures, they use eye gaze in order to address that one specific point in space amongst many other potential reference. And I have this little video clip to show you guys of what I mean when I refer to that communication. That one. I hope you all heard. He said that one. <laughs> Heard perfect. And as in this video, we use spatial demonstratives, pointing and gazing to deliver a clear and coherent message. In the experiments, whenever I refer to that communication, this sort of act is what I am meaning. And I will now briefly touch upon each element of that communication. The first one is spatial demonstratives. Um, they are universal. They're present in every language and the availability of words in the didactic system may differ. For example, in English, we have this and that. And in Turkish, there are three words such as şu, bu and o. But they're pretty much used with um, uh, same purpose. But of course, there's wide range of research contrasting them, but we won't be getting into that today. And they, again, they're useful in establishing joint attention. And they, will, they do all up quite early on. They are preceded by gestures. Like imagine little kids when they try to communicate with you, they use also their gestures, also movements. And this is followed by use of the spatial demonstratives. And they are highly associated with gestures overall, which brings us to our second element of um, didactic communication that I will touch upon is the gestures. Gestures are important both for the speaker and the listener. 
the observer must understand that they're being communicated with. They should understand um, the goal of the communication and gestures has been there. For, for, for both use of the speaker and the listener, it can reduce the cognitive burden and the communicative burden both for the speaker and the listener. It can be in different forms and shapes, such as open palms, eye pointing, chin pointing. But throughout this presentation, whenever I mention gesture, I mean a pointing arm, which is the main associated one in, in the English language with the language use of this and that. So on. And they again are useful when um, guiding to attention towards a reference. And they happen simultaneously and pretty much synchronously with language use. For example, in this 2004 pet experiment, Van Gerter showed that pointing and the axis saw so special demonstratives or the word or the other word classes of um, directed communication co-occur, especially when target is proximal. I will briefly talk about what they did to find this evidence. So they had two participants, one having the role of director and one having the role of matcher. And the, the task was to have people, these two, these two participants, ident correctly identify the faces in the stimulus array. That is, as you can see in the little figure. And the director had this name sheet with um, 10 of the 20 possible targets and their names associated. And he or she was trying to um, point and describe these faces and targets with their names. And the task of the matcher was to write these answers to the answer sheet, which only had the faces, but not that. So this, I don't, sorry, I, I didn't mention the stimulus are faces. And the task of the matcher was to write down the names as they successfully identified. And uh, where the stimulus was presented varied in distance, it was either in close reach or far reach. And the results suggested that people use pointing with language together, mostly when the stimulus array was closer and they kept on using pointing as it got farther. But the combination of views reduced. And um, I will now briefly talk to us about the second cue, the eye gaze. They cue lots of things. Their eyes can say a lot as well. They they cue for social engagement. So by the look of my look towards you, you can understand that I'm engaging with you. They can identify where my attention is, or the the like it can modulate the attention of two interlocutors, and we can understand the speaker's intentions and. We can see each other's emotions through eye gaze. And uh, in the 2020 paper, Stickenbrook, I hope I pronounced the name right, I identified around 10 jobs of eye gaze, but I'm only gonna touch upon a couple of them today. First one is the mutual context understanding. So through eye gaze, we can, get, uh, we can establish our mutual space of, of communication of our target, of our context. And this helps us focus our interaction. And also throughout eye gaze, we can track each other's focus of point and tar identify targets. They, um, they did an uh, eye tracking experiment, which I believe was topic recently as well, outside in public environment. It was a mobile eye tracker of the topics. And they found that, that the, the, the two, two speakers were wearing these glasses and they were asked to refer to things in their natural environment. And they found that indeed um, pointing, eye gaze and, um, and words happen synchronously and people share a triadic relationship of the I, I guess specifically so, for example, the speaker looks at adressee, adressee looks at speaker, they together look at the referent. It is a constant interpretive act, I guess. Um, yes. And as I mentioned earlier, ch children, the, the didactic communication is one of the earliest tools that children have. And in this experiment by Todiska 2020, they looked at the 
use of that the communication between the caregiver and child in terms of verbal production, pointing, and I guess. And they found that that children actually they use um, overwhelmingly all of the three modalities when trying to refer to um, a, share, a specific item in this shared space. As in this, this they were reading the storybook and the kid was about the caregivers were just pointing at them. And again, they found they good evidence for the synchronous use of the didactic communication. And also looking at synchronicity, um, Kelly et al. found out that um, synchrony of language and action or gesture influence our reaction times and accuracy. They used um, visual and auditory, visuals were videos and the auditory also was present within these videos, so the third stimuli, and they would either match or mismatch. And the target, the task was, okay, I will just give you a quick example. Of, this image that we see is a mismatch, for example. It says here the auditory stimuli was chopped vegetables, while in the videos, the, there was actually the action of pouring. And the task in this experiment was that people will see this word, and then they were asked to, they will see the word pouring and they were asked either to focus on audio or video. And if the audio and video are mismatching, people tend to react slower and less accurate. Again, just another example for how um, didactic cues are synchronous, didactic elements are synchronous. While we know that um, in like the communication, all like pointing, language, ideas, they co-occur. What we don't know is their relative importance during communication. So which brings us to the experiments that we did and in which we tried to understand the relative role of each cue when guiding listeners attention. And we manipulated the congruency of pointing, ideas and words which I will elaborate on in a minute. And we, we, while designing these experiments and looking at the data, we had three main questions in head. First one is what happens when pointing and eye gaze were, or language were presented individually? And then the second question was when they were presented together, what is the relative importance of each cue? And the third question is whether if there is a cost to incongruency, so what happens when two cues are incongruent? And we did this by having three online experiments designed in Gorilla exper online experimentation tool. And in these experiments, people saw images of Peter, a person, one of the co-authors, and he was pointing and gazing at two items placed in front of him. And participants were asked to fill in a two word sentence by choosing one of the two potential answers. And in ex first experiment, the options were to choose from were spatial demonstrative. So they had to pick in from this and that. And in the second experiment, they would have to pick name or one other potential reference. So, for example, if when we look at this image, the boxes would have peach and kiwi in them as potential answers. And I will now mention how we actually manipulated congruency. So when participants saw the image, they, they, they saw Peter looking and gazing at them. And he will point either at the proximal point or gaze either at the proximal position and distal position. Or, and we operationalized proximal distal from the perspective of imaged person. So the items were proximal to Peter or distal from Peter. And participants were asked to fill the two-word sentence from his perspective as well. And the verbal cue was always presented in the two word sentence, and it was always there. It would either target the proximal item or the distal item in the, yeah. And 
that I will now show you some examples of the possible combinations of pointing and gazing in the experimental design. They were either presented individually or together, or there was no pointing or gazing. So Ethan had his eyes closed and arm resting. Here on the left, we can see that Peter, the, the pointing arm is targeting the distal item. And here, the gaze is on the distal item. And as I mentioned, they were also presented together. And when they were presented together, they could either match congruently or mismatch. For example, when they would match, both pointing and gaze would be, for example, at the distal item. And when they mismatched, as in, 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 this, in this image, the pointing could be at the proximal item while eye gaze was on the distal. This was the, how the stimuli looked like. Then the verbal cue was always present because it was in the two words sentence. So. And the procedure. We had a repeated measures design. So every participant completed the, every single level of the experiment. And there were a total of 72 experiment tri experimental trials with four blocks, giving us four data points for each level of the design. So 18 levels, including verbal cue, again, pointing, gazing, proximal, distal, absent. So yeah, that will give us a total of 18 levels. And all the trials and blocks were randomized across participants. And we had 12 filler trials to make sure to capture that whether the participants were attending and the filler tasks were end back tasks. So they had to see, we asked them whether if the image they're seeing now was the same one as they just saw, the one, be one before. And at the end of four experimental blocks, we had a gaze detection task to see how accurately people were detecting gaze. And based on performance in these two experiments, participants were included or not in the further analysis. And now I will outline the next three experiments. In the first experiment, the outcome was the, the choice of special demonstratives, either this or that. And we know that range of spatial and non-spatial factors influence spatial demonstrative use. And one of these is reachability. And in Cohen et al, they suggested that items within our reach so to say pay personal space, were more likely to be labeled with what this and the items in outside our reach, items in our exterior personal space were more likely to be labeled with the word that than this. It is in fine our pocket. Um, in the experiment one, we looked at, uh, at the participants' choices of spatial demonstratives, either this or that, while feeling the two word sentence. And at the beginning of experiments, we told participants, okay, take his perspective and pick a word you think that he would have said. And they didn't see that um, phrase, which word would he pick during the experimental trials. They saw it at the introduction trials, at the, sorry, the training trials. And in experiment two, now the verbal cues is spatial demonstrative. So in half of the trials, they saw the word this. And another half, they saw the word that. And they were picking one of the two potential reference, potential targets. And in experiment three, the only difference between experiment two and three is where the, the two word sentence was placed. So at experiment three, it was in a speech bubble inside the image. And again, people were to pick, again, the half of the trials were this, half were with that, and they had to, participants had to pick one of the two potential reference. Here, I just, just to give you guys an overall image, overall contrast of what each experiment looks like. And um, now I will show us some results, but I'm only going to give you results from experiment one and three for sake of time saving. And also they were very similar as, I, as you just seen in the stimulus layout two, two and three are pretty similar. And the only difference was the spatial demonstrative, the verbal cue at experiment two did not have a significant result. So then in experiment three, they all had, and I will just now briefly mention our findings. 
for every experiment, we did separate models of analysis and we used generalized linear models with binomial distribution. And then we used into, into random components, we put as many variables possible that were theoretically coherent and also that our model converged. Our three main factors or predictors were the pointing, gazing, and verbal cue. And verbal cue, as I mentioned, and experiment one was the name of one of the two reference and in special demonstratives in experiment three and two. Here's a gentle reminder of what our three questions were. And now we will look at our data from the perspective of these three questions. And in experiment one, um, pointing and verbal cue had a significant main effect. Verbal cue in this little image is Kiwi, for example, here, and it's the distal item. But this is just an example. Pointing and verbal cue also had a significant interaction. However, gazing did not have any main effect or any, any interaction with the other variables. And here, we, as we can see, when the verbal cue was proximal, participants picked, um, <laughs> sorry, here we have the main effects. And we scored the data in terms of participants picking over this. So whenever they picked were this, we gave them score of one. When they picked were that, we gave them score of zero. And then all the analysis are carried out on this data. And so when participants in the trial, and this graph is with all the conditions collapsed. So this is just the overall whenever participants saw, for example, proximal cue, 90% of the time they picked the word this, and it drops to 6% when they saw that. So when they saw the distal cue. And when pointing is proximal, again, 61%, and it drops to 33% when they saw the saw a distal pointing. Unfortunately, gaze did not have any significant effect in this experiment. And um, now we will have a brief look at the interaction of verbal cue and pointing. They had uh, the aesthetic symbolizes significant interactions. And the yellow bars are when the verbal cue was targeting the proximal item, and orange is when it was distal. And first bar here shows that there is no point in this part, there's no pointing. So this is the individual role, individual um, effectiveness of verbal cue to guide attention and to the effect, its effect on picking the word this. And as we can see, it's quite high. Our, and then when we have both pro, uh, pointing and verbal cue targeting the proximal item, this effect is even higher. So having two cues accentuated this effect. When they were incongruent, so to say when the verbal cue was mismatching pointing and verbal cue was proximal and pointing was distal, there is a reduction in the likelihood of picking the word this. So having distal point will lead to a decrease in in the likelihood of picking word this, but it's still quite high. Although the distal verbal cue and pointing did not have any interaction, we can see here that when the verbal cue is distal, chances are quite low to pick the word this. Therefore, what does this mean? And um, pointing and verbal cue had significant influence on demonstrative choices of these participants. And compared to any, any other interaction of verbal cues and pointing, when both were targeting the proximal position, participants were more likely to pick the word this. And overall, seeing a proximal verbal cue led to the higher chances of picking the word this. And we will have a look now at the experiment three. And in this experiment, all factors, pointing, eye gaze, and spatial demonstrative had significant effect. Pointing also had a significant interaction with the demonstrative scene and with gazing. However, there was no three -way interaction. Here we can see again the main effect, uh, collapse across con the scores are co co collapse across conditions. And when the participants saw the word this, 77% of the time they picked 
the proximal item. Now, the, uh, let me just remind again to avoid confusion. Now, the people are not picking demonstratives anymore. They are seeing the demonstrative as verbal cue, and they are picking name of one of the two potential targets. And we scored this data in terms of their likelihood of picking the proximal item. So when they picked the closer item, we gave them a score of one. When they picked the further item, we gave them a score of zero. So here we can see their, like, the chunk, the percent likelihood of people picking the proximal item, which is at 77% when they see the word this. And it falls to 51% when say, they see the word that. And the trend for the gaze is pretty similar as the previous one. So I said it has a strong effect here again. And when now we also have a significant effect of eye gaze, and in 83% of trials when eye gaze is proximal, people picked the proximal item, and it falls to 27% when it's distal. We can see that with no eye gaze and also with no pointing, there is still high chances but that is most probably due to their interaction with each other. So, which we will now briefly talk about. First of all, I would like to talk about the interaction of the verbal cue and pointing. And at this, all the levels of interactions were significant. So I didn't put any asterisks or whatsoever. And with the yellow bars represent the, when the conditions when participants saw the word this and orange bar when they see the word that. And um, then, yeah, then their chances of picking the proximal item is our score here. When there is no pointing, the chance the when they saw the word this, participants were more likely to pick the proximal item compared to conditions when they saw the word that. However, when there is a proximal pointing, and I'm oh, sorry, I'll come back to that in a sec. And they see the proximal pointing, they, they're more likely to pick the proximal item compared to the when they saw the distal pointing. And um, yeah, this was the case when there was a, the likelihood of picking again the sorry, proximal item was still high when pointing was proximal, but here and then, then they saw the verbal cue that it was still high. And having this still pointing led to again a, a reduction in the chances of picking the proximal item. So we could say that pointing has a very strong effect on verbal cues as well. The pointing is, tends to be the dominant cue here. And when we were to look at the interaction of pointing and eye gaze. So here I split the graph to two. On the left hand side here, pointing and eye gaze are presented individually. And on the right, they're presented together. And first we will talk about what happens when they're presented individually. So pointing and eye, having proximal pointing and eye gaze almost like they led to higher chances of picking the proximal item pretty much at the same level. So on their own, they were both very strong cues. And well, as we can see when they were distal, there's a reduction. And when pointing and eye gaze were presented together and they were matching and they were targeting the closer position, the proximal position, the effect is now increased, it's even stronger and they were, highly likely to pick the proximal item. And reduction when they see the distal, when two cues are targeting the distal position and yellow bars again symbolizing when the two, two cues match. And the blue bars then that are symbolizing when the, the, the mismatch in two cues show that when pointing has again a strong effect on gaze two, because when, as long as the pointing was proximal, even though eye gaze was distal, again, participants were still highly likely to pick the proximal item. And, all, and then there's a reduction, where then they see the distal pointing. However, um, sorry, however, as we could say, he, when we contrast, this is, if this might become a touch too complicated now, so, well, I will say it anyway, and then we can discuss later. When, when we compare the distal pointing and proximal eye gaze condition to condition where both cues are matching 
and they are distal, still participants are more likely to pick the proximal item because the eye gaze is proximal. So there is an effect of eye gaze still, but it is just not as strong as pointing when they are presented together. Therefore, pointing, eye gaze, and spatial demonstratives are all significant didactic cues. However, pointing is the strongest didactic cue. And in absence of pointing, eye gaze is also a strong cue. When both pointing and eye gaze are present, the effect there, when present and sorry, I should added it, and, and matching, the effect is stronger, the effect. And if eye gaze and pointing mismatch, people are more likely to be guided by pointing. These were the three main experiments, and I will and I will briefly mention what we are doing right now based on the, our current findings. We are looking at the dynamics of didactic communication. What I mean by that, as we know in in real life, we don't really look at stills of people and decide what they are referring to. With that in mind, we we now made two different stimuli type. We now have videos and static images of people, which are static images consisted stills taken from videos. Let me just show you an example. This one. And the static cue had image with the audio. I'm playing that now. This one. And we were wondering what if we would replicate one thing, replicate our findings, and if there would be any difference between seeing a static image versus a dynamic video. And indeed, we found that seeing different types of stimuli also had an effect, and they were also um, the effects of and all the pointing eye gaze demonstratives, they still had effects, so therefore we replicated our previous findings. And now all factors had a stronger effect for both pointing and demonstratives and stuff, but the most importantly and interesting, the eye gaze also had a stronger effect. Here on this graph, we are contrast, the green bar represents the conditions where pe people saw the videos and orange bar when they saw the images and the contrast the significant contrasts are again uh, marked with an asterisk and this graph only has the data where pointing and gaze were presented individually and here we can see that um, when the pointing is proximal on its own again individually without any sorry gazing on its own without any pointing there is a significant difference between dynamic and static conditions and even larger, sorry, an even larger one when the gazing is distal. Interestingly, and that also that says that could most probably mean that people are now seeing the trajectory of eye movement, which is most probably also an important factor when perceiving the didactic cues. Yeah. That's that for the current research. So what does all this mean? Um, when guiding attention of a cone specific, regardless of incongruent gazing or verbal cue, pointing is the most dominant didactic, cue, didactic communication. And in absence of pointing, I guess it's also strong. And, and more cues are better than one. So when we, these are all like, bear in mind our previous three questions, right? We are now answering them all. More cues are indeed better than one. And because when language is combined with pointing, also gaze when it's combined with pointing, their effects are just stronger. And when cues are incongruent, pointing captures more attention. And this could be due to the fact that gesture is just a stronger, more salient cue. This has a salient moment. And there is a large explicit point of arrow target with pointing, and gesture just tends to be more fundamental in to the lang to language. And now we will try to have a temporal, we will now play with the temporal dynamics of pointing, gazing, and the language. We will decouple demonstratives from pointing and for example, and just play with their synchrony in time. So when it starts and when it ends, because we say they are synchronous, they are simultaneous, but we don't exactly know how synchronous they are in terms of when they happen. Although there is some research, of course, looking, but their pointing comes first, language comes first. Uh, so we will be looking at that. And I we are planning, if COVID permits, to bring all this to EG environment. 
And I would tell you that these might have some implications to other fields such as human machine interaction and all that type of development, and also a contribution for the theory of like the communication. And that will be all from me. And thank you very much for listening. And if you wish to find out more, we will discuss in a minute as well. And please do contact us, myself or Kenny. Thank you. Please hit me if I don't have any more questions. Great. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, we have about five minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to uh, raise their, uh, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand virtually and uh, please go ahead and ask the questions. Uh, I see we have uh, one, so please uh, go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, great presentation. I was wondering, I was curious about individual differences. Um, yes. And so I could imagine that, you know, like that uh, people in conversations may differ in how, um, uh, how much they focus on different types of cues. So I could imagine that, that uh, you know, a shy person might be you know, like more or less inclined to look other people into the eye, so may, re may rely less on that, uh, that cue. Um, did you find any uh, like patterns of individual differences in your data? Well, not with this one because, and there is some research that, for example, they notice that people have different um, strategies when they use like the communication. And there's a huge, one of them is the second work paper that they said that people really differed a lot when they were gesturing, when they were using words or so. So people differ in their strategies indeed. But with this experiment, we didn't really find so much between participants variance because it was ritually, like they saw the stimuli and they had to pick one of the two options. So we didn't really see so much of a between participant variance now. But if there it may, it may there so. must be something, most probably. <laughs> yeah, there could be yeah. Yes. Any more questions? Looks like there's um, another question. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um Hello. great talk. Uh so my question is on sort of probably an orthogonal issue to Max's question, which is the relative discriminability of gaze direction and pointing direction. Um, I could imagine if you had objects that were very close together versus farther apart, and whether those objects, for example, were, so in your current experiment design, they were differing in depth relative to the camera, as opposed to, you could alternatively have had them differ in lateral displacement or yes. depth and lateral displacement, all of which it seems like would affect the ability to discriminate gaze angle potentially differentially from discriminating pointing direction. So I was just wondering if you, uh, is there any work or any evidence from your studies that those two cues have different reliabilities? Well, this, this is one of the reasons why we had the gaze detection at the end to see, we thought maybe gaze will be harder to dis discriminate. And finding these different findings in the dynamic static conditions, we can see that the, the action of gaze may, because pointing kept on having a strong effect throughout, right? And eye gaze just had strong, at first experiment, it didn't have effect. And in the final video experiments, it had a very strong one. So we could say that there must be something with the salience or with the, with the ways of, with that we see eye gaze, it could differ most probably, and there is some work that contrasts lateral versus um, sagittal organization of items, but they didn't directly look at how effective, not that I, most probably, there might be some work that I'm not aware, but that wasn't the scope of what we looked at. Um, we just try to make it as natural as, as normal as one would see when you see sitting in front of someone else and whatever cues are available. My, one may be more discriminable than the other, and that would be definitely an interesting separate line of work. Yeah, that makes sense. I imagine that the this versus that comparison is also much less interesting if things are just laterally placed, because it's sort of, there's probably no lawful reason why someone would use this or that for something well, that's left there, or right. There's actually some work, and I could pass, send you, if you want, we could share some, some of these articles, like I could pass okay. on. There is some work that is contrasting lateral versus sagittal and reachability in that sense as well. There is some work that is trying to show if there's any difference there is some work and I am happy to share that work later with you if you drop me a line
Okay, great. Uh, thank you again uh, for that uh, really interesting talk and the interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so um, in the interest of time, uh, we can move on to the second speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Snejana Shegeva um, with the talk title from uh, George the Georgia Institute of Technology with the talk title, The Role of Symmetry in Core Geometry. I'm not sure that I can see the either of the authors in the room or am I missing something? Okay, it maybe looks like the authors are not in the Zoom call. If if you are, please, I apologize if I'm missing it, um, but please unmute yourself. <laughs> mm. You could change the order and uh, email the, uh, the yeah. email the presenter. That seems like the best solution. Um, I mean, can any of the organizers? Uh, yeah. Well, does that uh, sound like a good? Yeah. Well, thank, uh, thanks. I think this is a good uh, good solution. So we will drop a message to Snejana and and probably because of time differences or or. Uh, issue. So, uh, if if Max, if you could go ahead with with the third talk, I, I, it would be a, a, an awesome solution, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway. Uh, great. Okay. I was it was just yeah. to go to take a bio break, but. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, if we're all good to continue, um, our next speaker is Max uh, Kina Tater. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, from uh, National Research Council of Canada. Uh, with the talk title, Assessing Effects of Reduced Vision on Spatial Orientation Ability Using Virtual Reality. Please take it away. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let me just figure out how to share my screen. And All right, uh, I hope everyone can see my slides. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, uh, th thank you very much for having us. Um, and uh, today I will talk to you about uh, assessing effects of reduced vision on spatial orientation ability using virtual reality. Um, uh, like uh, this is work that was carried out while I was a postdoc at Dartmouth College in Emily Cooper's lab, in Emily Cooper's lab. Um, oops. Okay, here we go. Um, so millions of people around the world live with visual impairments, and many of those are considered to be legally blind. Um, however, it's important to note that the majority of people who are legally blind uh, fall into the category of low vision. Um, that is, they still have functional vision, albeit severely impaired. Um, there's also not just one type, uh, one type of, uh, of low vision or two types of low vision. Uh, however, this is a rather broad category of visual impairments. Um, that being said, however, uh, many causes of visual impairment either primarily affect central vision, which is so, shown in the middle here, um, causing reduced visual acute sensitivity near the point of fixation. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, other causes primarily affect peripheral vision, um, that is causing a restriction, restriction of the visual field, um, that is sometimes also referred to as tunnel vision, and I've shown here on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, many aspects of basic perceptual and cognitive processes uh, that underlie successful navigation um, with low vision are still relatively poorly understood. Um, we know, however, that reduced visual ability impacts many aspects of spatial cognition. For example, about, uh, when you think about route finding, um, room familiarization, or if we have to identify uh, unfamiliar objects in front of us. Uh, for this presentation, however, um, I will focus on reorientation. So that is that's the task uh, one needs to complete in order to regain one's bearing after losing orientation. So how does one regain one's heading after disorientation? Um, you could also slightly rephrase this question in a more Gibsonian way, if you will, um, by asking what is the information available to in the environment to do this task? And a typical environment contains an abundance of visual features that can help with orientation. And, and these can be broadly grouped into uh, what sometimes called geometric cues about the structural layout or the layout of the environment and feature cues such as uh, objects uh, or landmarks in, in, in the environment. Um, just to illustrate this point, um, imagine for a moment that you are in this room and you've lost your bearing. Um, 
you could use the geometric properties in terms of distances and angles to distinguish, for example, between the long, long wall and the short wall in this room. Um, you could also use feature cues, uh, such as the objects or colors uh, in the room, um, and use discrete landmarks. Um, and the benefit that these have that they can provide unambiguous, unambiguous information uh, on the location of a target. For example, I could say things like um, the lamps located between the two curtains in this image. Um, spatial orientation and low vision has been studied extensively, and it has been shown that uh, people with low vision are able to, for example, accurately judge the dimensions of a room. Um, however, what also needs to be said is that wayfinding performance is usually reduced with low vision, especially in um, yeah, even in when uh, the, uh, the, the environments are visually pretty rich. Um, the performance differences between uh, uh, in these spatial orientation tasks are likely related to changes in gaze behavior, but also to the type of information that is accessible to a person. For example, uh, Kalia and colleagues found that in a wayfinding task that people with simulated low vision relied on additional non-geometric cues compared to uh, unimpaired control participants. Uh, reorientation after disorientation has also been studied extensively. Um, uh, but not as so much in the realm of low vision as far as I'm aware. Um, so reorientation requires an accurate representation of the space. And uh, this seminal paper by Cheng ha had this brilliant insight that rotational errors can be informative on what information an organism relies on when reorienting. Um, there have been a multitude of studies uh, in a range of different species that shown that uh, organisms can use both geometric and feature information. And, um, yeah, so now I'm going, just going to go through this paradigm in the, in, in the next few slides. So this paradigm typically involves three steps uh, the, uh, in which the participants or um, subject finds themselves typically in a rectangular room that has, uh, so as seen from above in the slide, that has, um, may have, you know, like a, dis a, a distinctive feature such as a color wall or something like that. Um, the task of the participant then is to learn the location of a target, for example, a reward that may be hidden underneath the box. Um, then you take the participant out of that environment, disorient them, and then throw them back into this environment. Um, uh, and now the target is hidden. And the task of the participant is to identify the location of the target. <clears throat> and this can be done either by pointing at it or by you know, navigating to it. For example, in this case, in the correct corner. Um, for good practical reasons, most previous studies were, uh, previous, previous work has measured performance by testing in which corner subjects would look for the target. But it would also be interesting to, ex uh, to expand the original paradigm to a more finely grained measure of performance. Um, so, for example, by having participants point toward the target location, we can measure um, angular response error, which has a number of advantages. For example, we can now place targets pretty much anywhere in the room. We are no longer restricted to uh, the corners of this of the geom geometry, and the measure itself is more fine grained because it allows for uh, a continuous response measure. Um, yeah, so we could use this measure to assess response accuracy overall, so how well people do this task, and uh, we, but more interestingly, we can use it to identify uh, systematic biases in response error that can be used to assess what information people are using for reorientation. Um, so. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a few examples. Um, in this example, we see uh, a, 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 a geometric a rectangle room um, that has a blue wall feature. And there may be, may be a target uh, located around here uh, in the corner of the room. If we plot a hypothetical response, response error of a person pointing to, that, uh, to the location of the target, this should uh, follow a unimodal distribution peaking around the correct response. Is just shown here on the right. However, if there's no feature present, so here we have no blue wall, uh, the geometric um, information alone in rectangular spaces is ambiguous. Um, in this case, in the case of the um, rectangle here, there are two geometric correct uh, locations that are 180 degrees apart. So consequently, the uh, hypothetical response errors should follow a bimodal distribution which peaks around um, zero degree error and uh, 180 degrees apart. Um, so the brilliant idea that uh, came to, to, to this paradigm was that uh, to, it was to introduce a Q conflict condition. Um, so uh, when cues conflict between learning and tests, the type of error participants make indicates what information they, they rely on. 
Um, so uh, again, we we'll, so in this example, um, we see a participant who's learned with the uh, 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 who's learned the location of the target uh, with uh, uh, in a rectangular space. Um, but what changes between learning and tests is that the location of this feature wall has moved by 90 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so if a person primarily relied on geometric information, uh, the hypothetical responses should still accumulate at the two geometrically, uh, geometrically correct locations, uh, meaning at zero, uh, zero degrees error and 180 degrees apart from that. Or if feature information is more dominant, responses should accumulate towards 90 degrees. Um, our goal was to use this paradigm to study spatial orientation in simulated low vision. Uh, we wanted to learn what information people access when reorienting with reduced visual acuity and reduced visual field. Um, and virtual reality is a useful tool to do this um, because we have, um, as you may know, we have, a, we have a very high control over the experimental setup. Um, but at the same time, we can create the visually very rich uh, and realistic environments. Uh, we can also do things like teleporting. Uh, which is uh, uh, teleporting and more importantly for our purposes, we can rotate the environment independent of the physical location. Uh, that means it's pretty easy to disorient uh, participants uh, between learning and test. Um, yeah, and VR is also makes it relatively easy to uh, implement a paradigm that uses a continuous response error because we suggest simply measure, for example, where participants point or the heading or uh, heading angle of their with the VR headset. Um, so to dive into the studies, um, uh, we used, uh, a, as I said, a, a virtual reality experiment where participants were wearing a commercial VR headset. Um, and for the majority of the experiment, uh, participants found themselves in a gray rectangular room uh, that had a blue uh, feature wall in some of the conditions, as is shown here. Um, each trial consisted of four different phases. We had an initial disorientation phase, then we had a target presentation or learning phase, uh, then we had a second disorientation phase, and then we had a, uh, we had a test phase with which participants had to reorient again. Um, <clears throat> in each trial, participants started out in an empty star field, um, and they had to turn multiple times, times to face a green target that appeared, um, that appeared on the horizon for them at, at eye level. Uh, which this is a 360 degree screenshot here on the side, at the bottom, so you can see that it's, it's a void environment and participants had to rotate a few times until they were fully disoriented. And uh, for just we had to play around with this a little bit because initially we had participants who tried to um, keep uh, a physical anchor in the into, in the real world. So they placed one of their feet really solidly on the ground and just turned while keeping the the, the foot in the same location. Um, and uh, it took us a while to to figure that out. But some participants were doing that. Um, um, but um, yeah. So next, we uh, in the learning phase or the target presentation phase, uh, participants were teleported into a rectangular room and had to orient themselves towards a gold coin that was presented at a random orientation on the horizon. And the task was then to memorize the location of the gold coin. Then we repeated our disorientation procedure in the star field, and then we uh, teleported our participants back into the rectangular room. Um, the yellow coin was now no longer visible, and the participants had to turn towards the towards the target location and um, uh, had to press a button when they believed that they had turned towards the target location. Um, yeah. So what we also did is that we rotated the rectangular room um, towards a random orientation between target presentation and test. So there was really no physical um, relationship in. in uh, in the rotation of the two uh, of the two uh, of the of the rectangular rules between learning and testing, uh, and then we measured participants' angular error and their response time. We had uh, three experimental conditions, um, and uh, yeah, so we had one condition where there was no feature at all during learning and test phase, uh, which we call the rectangular room condition. Uh, we have the blue blue feature wall condition. Uh, in which the room had a uh, blue feature in it, an additional blue feature wall uh, during learning and test. And then importantly, we had the conflict condition in which the location of the feature wall moved 90 degrees between learning and testing. Each participant uh, went through uh, uh, went through 36 trials and, um, and we also gave them a sufficient amount of breaks in between trials. Um, 
So remember that we also wanted to test uh, the effects of simulated low vision. Uh, so to this end, we randomly assigned our participants into three experimental groups. We had one control group with normal, quote unquote, normal unimpaired vision, and two groups with simulated impaired vision. And to simulate low vision, we asked participants to wear uh, modified swim goggles underneath the VR headset. Uh, depending on the group, these were we either used vanguard occlusion foils um, or covered the goggles uh, completely, except for a small pinhole in front of the right eye. Um, so this table shows you, uh, an, gives you an overview of the experimental groups. So as a total, we tested 30 participants with 10 subjects in each group. Uh, and the low number of participants is certainly the weak point of our study that I need to mention here, and which we can hopefully rectify in future work. Uh, but I will come back to this point uh, at a, at a later in the talk. Um, so the low acuity group uh, had a visual acuity of uh, 1.3 logmar because of the, because of the uh, occlusion foils. And the reduced field group had 20% uh, uh, of visual field only in the right eye only. Um, yeah, so as mentioned earlier, we measured response time and angular error. Um, that is the angular distance between the correct target location and the orientation and, uh, of participants um, and their orientation of participants. Um, and the spread of this error data uh, describes the response precision. Uh, to quantify response precision, we developed a model that assumed that probability of errors is highest at in geometrically identical solutions. Um, to this end, we, uh, our model combines multiple so-called Barmesis distributions. Um, maybe let's take a look at the single Barmesis distribution first. So these can be understood as a circular version of a normal distribution and that have a, a, a concentration parameter called kappa. And the kappa describes essentially how pointy or broad or widely spread this distribution is. And you can say the higher kappa is, um, the pointy the distribution is. Um, so in, in our model, the probability of a given uh, angular response error theta uh, is specified as a sum of multiple Balmesis distributions with different means divided by the number of the elements. Um, here, kappa denotes, as I said before, the, 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 the Balmesis concentration parameter um, alpha denotes the angle in radians to geometrically equivalent locations uh, contained in a set of uh, in a set of A, and N simply denotes the number of elements in A. And what we did is that we left the spread of the response error uh, as an unknown free parameter. Um, so what we did then is that we used the, the maximum likelihood method to fit the response of each participant with our hypothetical model. Um, and let's take a look at some examples of, uh, of the rectangular room condition without feature. Um, so there's no feature wall in this condition here. And this is data from three different participants. Um, in the case of the participant in the control group, uh, we saw that uh, uh, we saw that, the, saw that the participant was relatively precise and we can see peaks at the, for the two geometrically correct solutions, which then means that returns this relatively high kappa value. Um, uh, in the two other conditions, however, you can see that the precision is uh, noticeably lower. And in the participant in the reduced field condition was essentially guessing, and the model didn't really fit, fit that data at all. Um, so yeah, now that we've got that out of the way, let's take a look at the data. Um, here we plot the response precision for the rectangular, for the rectangular group, um, uh, for the uh, different rectangular rooms. Um, as like, again, kappa is the dependent variable is the response precision. And we find the higher the kappa value, the tighter the, the distribution is. Uh, we found that in the uh, re reduced field group, uh, that, that the, we found that the reduced field was significantly less precise than the two other groups. Um, this was, we found this in the rectangular room. We found, had the same finding in the rectangular room with an additional feature wall. And, um, to our surprise, we found the same. We, we found the same effect in the conflict condition. However, we did not find an effect of uh, condition. So we did. We find we found the main effect of group, but no effect of condition. Um, next, um, we, let's take a look at the response time. So this time on the y-axis, we plot the response time in seconds. And again, we found uh, the main effect of group in the rectangular uh, in in the in the room without features in the room with the consistent feature. And however, this time we found also a main effect of condition in the sense that participants in the 
conflict condition needed longer to um, to complete the trial, um, and uh, and particularly so in in the in the, in the uh, in the reduced field group. Um, so taken together, this, these results suggest that the task may have been harder for participants in the reduced field group uh, and in the, in the conflict condition. Um, however, the question that we we're trying to answer was not only how precise participants were, but also if they were more giving more weight to the feature or the geometric information. To investigate this, we slightly elaborated the model uh, for rooms that have a salient feature and added another free parameter describing the feature weight. Um, so here you can see that if no weight, the uh, W, is given to the, uh, to the blue feature wall, the model is the same as the original model. Uh, if the weight, if all the weight is given to the feature, the first part of the equation essentially becomes zero. Um, so here we've got feature weight in the conflict conditions. And looking at the scatter plus, the, we need we need to appreciate the large individual differences uh, be, uh, that essentially swamped any discernible patterns. Uh, for instance, in each group, there were participants who either seemed to rely exclusively on, feature, uh, uh, on features or exclusively on geometry. Um, and this is really where our small sample size is, is, is haunting us. Um, we have more data on feature weight in the paper or, or at the end of the size if you're more interested in, but it looks, um, so this is the data from the conflict condition, but it looks pretty similar in, in all the other conditions as well. Um, so next, we wanted to bring the study from a rather artificial scenario into a visually richer and more natural environment. Um, we also wanted to explore dynamic changes in lighting conditions that may occur throughout the day, um, because changes in brightness and contrast can affect reorientation with reduced vision. Uh, we created um, a paradigm that was very similar to experiment one. Um, However, we found that the, room, uh, the rooms in experiment one were unrealistically sparse and um, for example, and the blue feature wall, especially when it moved around, it seemed pretty artificial. Um, to address this limitation, we created symmetric rooms with features that one could reasonably expect. Uh, for example, we added windows, uh, couches, artwork, and uh, vents into, those, uh, into the rooms and placed them symmetrically. Um, what we manipulated in this uh, in the studies that uh, was was the lighting. Um, so we had a lighting condition in which uh, all the light was coming from the ceiling, which we call a ceiling light condition, um, uh, where a light source was placed um, solely uh, uh, inside, within the room and had the, um, had the light was like e it was even and um, there's an even and ambient light with no with no shadows. Um, in the sunlight condition, however. Uh, we placed us, uh, a light source outside of the room that created a visible bright spot on the inside of the room, as you can see here. So we have a sunlight that's here. And so there's again a 360 degree screen, screenshot and the sun shines through, well, through one of the windows and then creates this visible spot uh, in, on one of the walls. Um, keeping the room shapes from experiment one, this essentially leads to three conditions. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a ceiling light condition in which there's a uh, the, the light is in this, uh, coming from the ceiling, uh, both during learning and testing, and with a sunlight condition, where the sunlight is, uh, uh, where the sun light is coming during into the, uh, is the only light source in, in both learning and testing, and uh, critically we have the dynamic light condition in which um, the light condition changes between learning and testing. So here we put the results on the left-hand side is the precision data and on the right-hand side is the response data. Um, overall, we found that participants were more precise than in experiment one. Um, initially, we were a little bit surprised by that, but it kind of makes sense because there is more, simply more inform there's a lot more information in the environments that we, that we have in this experiment. <clears throat> so there's a lot of clutter in there. And this is like a really interesting potential avenue for future, for, for future research, we think. Um, However, unlike in experiment one, we found no effect of group on precision. Um, so remember in experiment one, we found that the participants in the reduced field group um, were less precise than the other two groups. However, here, if anything, uh, the reduced field group was descriptively a little bit more precise than the others, um, uh, than the other two groups. Um, when we look at the data on response time, <coughs> however, we find similar patterns uh, compared to, uh, to experiment one, uh, to, to, ex to experiment one, where we found an, a main effect of 
condition and a main effect of groups. So here, uh, participants in the reduced field group were again slower than the other two uh, uh, groups and participants in the dynamic light condition, which I plotted here in the middle, um, were slower than in, the, uh, than in the other two conditions. Um, yeah, so we think that this highlights the importance of environmental factors during, uh, during reorientation. And our findings suggest that even highly common scene dynamics such as lighting can influence reorientation performance. Um, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned before, the more numerous visual features available in these rooms um, allow precision to be high despite the increased challenge. And uh, yeah, but all in all, we had hoped to find changes in brightness and contrast that could affect reorientation with reduced vision. However, we did not find strong evidence for that here. Um, yeah, just to discuss the results a little bit. Um, in summary, we developed a model describing response precision that can be used to assess what information people are using for reorientation and empirically found that reduced peripheral vision, but not so much, much reduced acuity, increased the response times and sometimes precision of our participants. Um, uh, I should say decreased precision. Um, uh, this indicates that, indicates that reduced visual field makes spatial orientation tasks more difficult, which is in line with previous research. And however, how visual impairment affects spatial orientation is not obvious, uh, which has also been shown by, by, by previous research. Um, what would be particularly interesting to see is how persistent the individual, the individual differences are that we observe when it, when it, uh, when it comes to use of feature information. Um, and here's, here are the two, limit, two limitations that we really need to acknowledge. So for one, we have the small sample size that did not allow us to identify reliable patterns with regard to feature weight. And in addition, we, while simulating low vision has certainly its strengths um, and justifications, it's important to acknowledge that a lifetime of low vision may lead to using different strategies that, uh, for spatial orientation tasks. Um, however, uh, acknowledging those limitations, uh, it means that our the future work is cut out for us, right? Uh, so we need to collect more data uh, and also test participants who live uh, with low vision to compare them to our simulated low vision results. Um, and yeah, so there are a number of really enticing avenues that could emerge from this work, uh, we think. Uh, so for instance, um, our findings have generated a hypothesis, where, um, for example, uh, 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 on the, you know, like reorientation performance may, could increase in more cluttered environments, which could be studied in future work. Um, also, um, given the visual, uh, the visual realism and the richness of scenes that can be shown and acted in VR, uh, this paradigm um, could be developed into sort of a standardized assessment tool to measure mobility in low vision, for example. Um, one could, for example, try to learn how mobility, tra mobility training um, for low vision would influence performance or you know, certain types of uh, orientation strategies. Uh, um, yeah, and more generally and beyond virtual reality alone, our study supports the notion that um, emerging display technologies can be used uh, to support spatial cognition tasks with low vision. Um, so just as an example, you could think of um, an assistive augmented reality device that provides users with low, vis uh, with low vision with uh, visual aids for tasks uh, such as room finding, room familiarization, object identification, or obstacle avoidance. Yeah, um, so with that, I would like to thank you again. And I would like to thank my co-author and mentor, Emily Cooper. Um, and uh, yeah, as well as uh, everyone else who supported this work. And uh, yeah, I uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share our work with you today. And I'm more than happy to take questions. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the great talk um, and uh, this uh, sort of really interesting body of very carefully designed experimental work. Um, so there's one, uh, there's two, a couple questions um, in the chat, uh, which I'll read out, but of course yep. uh, the participants who post them uh, can also uh, unmute themselves. Uh, so there's one um, uh, that says, thanks a lot for the presentation. I wonder if uh, the timing of impaired vision can also affect compensating approaches. The timing of impaired vision. So I think, so that uh, if I interpret this question correctly, so timing may, relate to how experienced a person is with using um, being visually impaired. Yeah, I think it might be, it might be, it may play a huge difference. So as someone, as, as I mentioned in the end, so imagine someone uh, who is considered uh, legally blind, but has functional, has functional vision. This person has uh, potentially a lot of experience using their, their, their vision 
um, and may vision for a spatial orientation task and may use it differently than someone who, you know, like a participant who just walked in, into our lab and you know, we put on the, the Vanguard occlusion foils with them. Um, it is, but also the, what, what's really important is, again to see is that there's, you know, like there's not just one person, not the one person with low vision. There's a, everybody, with, there's a huge variety in how low vision presents itself. And um, yeah, so yeah, but I, I, I agree, like timing of impairment uh, potentially plays, plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. um, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, the second question in the chat is, um, in your first experiment, can your participants use self-motion orient uh, information to reorient? Uh, no, um, and we so we tried. Yeah, we tried really hard to to to, to uh, and it took us a while to figure that out because some participants really tried to. Um, and uh, so the so the virtual rooms were orienting into random orientations that are like physically disconnected from the from, that are disconnected from the physical world. Uh, however, some so participants are like with their body in a physical environment, right? So they don't uh, leave their body for our studies. So some participants tried to anchor themselves uh, in the physical environment, use their, use their, um, uh, use the, uh, use a physical anchor word for, for, to do the task. So we saw, as I mentioned before, we saw participants um, placing a foot uh, on the ground and not moving that one single foot, uh, like anchoring that foot and then like only use the other foot to move around um, and kind of like use that for the task. Um, and when we so when we noticed that we you know we recently had to restart our data collection and uh, change our instructions and also like tell participants that this strategy wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and it looks like there's also a question uh, from Nora. You can go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks. That was a really interesting uh, uh, adaptation of the reorientation paradigm. Yeah. Um, and in particular, the use of continuous um, mm -hmm. positions. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I, I don't really know what positions you used. It seems to me a corner position is very different from anywhere along the edge and also mm -hmm. even an edge position close to a corner is different from a position sort of mm -hmm. in the middle yeah. of the area. The only other continuous response um, reorientation paradigm that I know of is something that um, Alex Twyman mm -hmm. and Mark Holden and I did in the real world, mm -hmm. which was actually in a trapezoid. And we found that yeah. where something was in the trapezoid actually mattered a lot. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You could see, like, in terms of, you know, like the visual field in a head-mounted display is smaller than in the real world, right? So, um, um, and you could. So, so just to answer your question first is, um, so the gold coin or the target was placed at a random angle, so completely random, um, and um, uh, yeah, and at at eye level of the participants. So like, so we, so we, and, like at the very beginning of the experiment, we logged in like the, the, the height of the participant. Oh, so, so it's also sometimes on the wall. It's not no, on the ground. No, it's all, so it's always at eye level. So it's like, would always appear at, at eye at, level. It would oh. always appear, it would always appear at eye level. And, um, and for a person who would be like tall, it would be a little bit higher and, and for a person okay. who would be small, it would be a little bit lower. Oh, wow. Um, but nobody's done that before. And that's really interesting because it takes you off the edge information where the floor meets the wall. For the tall participants, maybe. Huh? And, and for, but maybe not. I don't know. I think just in yeah. general. Yeah. I think it's interesting that yeah. it's, it's similar but different as a paradigm. Yeah. Well, thanks. And yeah, so we, I think we try to figure out if it is an effect, if something, what, like if things, as things get closer to the wall, if precision would increase, for example, but as far as I remember, that we didn't find any 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 of that. Um, yeah, um, yeah you're also trying... using random yeah. locations, so you're not yeah. systematically sampling. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I think Emily wanted to chime in. 
Yeah, no, I was just saying, I'm trying to remember if we systematically looked at wall placements versus corner placements, because we could certainly do that in a post hoc yeah. way since we uniformly yeah. sample. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, it, it's definitely something we could we could do a post hoc analysis yeah. on, um, because going back to the point that Max made about the second experiment, that there are just more visual features around we might expect to see performance near the corners in the first experiment to be more similar to performance mm -hmm. in the second. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely something that would be doable yeah. post hoc. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting point. I actually had a question that's potentially related to an earlier mm -hmm. one. So people weren't able to um, move, if I understood correctly, but do you have data on where they actually sort of looked? Were they able to turn their head? Um, yes, or so, were they mm -hmm. sort of, yeah. yeah so they, they could physically move. Um, <coughs> so they were instructed to stand in the same position, but um, they, I mean, in theory, they could walk, like, could walk to the wall. Uh, excuse me. It could walk to the could walk around the virtual environment, um, but uh, they uh, I had to try to remember the exact instruction. But it, it, participants didn't do that. So so they were standing physically in the same spot, and then were turning in place. And the measure, the dependent variable that we measured is the is the heading uh, heading of of the headset. So and um, so for example, um, we had to measure whether or not a participant looked at the target in. Uh, in in these disorientation trials, uh, we measured whether or not the so in this case the green disorientation target was centered in the field of view of the uh, of the screen. Um, yeah, so so participants could move around um, and could like physically turn. Mm -hmm. But again, this, so that so that physical turning shouldn't uh, didn't provide them with the information to solve the task because mm -hmm. the, the okay. room's oriented independently of that. Well, I should. Yeah, no, I understand now. Yeah. I, I thought it was just the sort of the last place they looked as if like that was like the place they indicated. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? Um, right, so I guess we have a few more um, minutes. Um, another question that occurred to me was, mm -hmm. I guess, which features do you think will be, so the lighting didn't seem to affect the um, performance too much, yeah. <laughs> um, but do you have sort of uh, intuitions about other features that might affect performance? Yeah, I, it might, I, so it may depend on which environment you're in, right? So I think there's like some findings that depending whether or not you are in a small and close environment, it makes it, larger difference in how you use uh, how uh, compared to more open outside outdoor environments for example where distal landmarks may become become more informative um, uh, so with just with that restriction in mind so for our particular study um, I could imagine that you know like the saliency of a feature could play an important role or maybe like uh, um, or what could also be what would so something just stands out a little bit more right and what would also be interesting to explore would be, you know, like if, you know, like if you learn that previously, like one feature has been shown to be more reliable than others, if that has an effect on um, uh, on how much weight people put on that feature or give to that feature. Yeah, that's a really um, interesting point. And I'm sure like for developing low vision models, that would be mm -hmm. a very important one if something is movable or not movable. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, really interesting work. Um, well, thanks a lot. Uh, this fun. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. Um, okay. So it sounds like uh, maybe we can move on to the third speaker. Thank you again, uh, Max, for a great uh, talk. Um, and uh, do we now, I think uh, Nejana is now in the audience. Yes. Great. So um, our third talk today um, is by Snejana Shegeva uh, from the Georgia Institute of Technology, um, and the title is The Role of Symmetry in Core Geometry. Thank you so much, and I apologize for everyone. I'm very well known for not knowing where I'm in space and time, and then that happens now. <laughs> no matter how excited I was for this conference, I just managed to not be on the right space. Um, Alrighty, so uh, I'm going to share my screen in a second. OK. 
Okie dokie. Present. Okay, so and everybody can see my screen now. Ex excellent. So um, I am Snezhana, as I was introduced, and I worked on it with my advisor, Ashok uh, Goyle, also at the um, Georgia Institute of Technology. And um, we are, second. And we are Designing Intelligence Lab at Georgia Tech. Uh, our main focus is on the human-centered artificial intelligence and uh, specifically visual reasoning and intelligence test. So they, um, in the last five years, that has been um, the focus of my research and specifically the, the team as well. We have multiple directions and everybody's um, finding their, uh, their different specific area that they can, they can, they can tackle. Uh, so here we have all the dual motivation for, uh, for what we are trying to do. On one side, we want to get inspired by uh, human cognition. And when we think about visual reasoning, we see like, what does a human actually do? So, so uh, they can help us design the AI, artificial intelligence a little bit uh, better and smarter. And, uh, but there's also the other, the other side as well, is that what if you start with uh, um, designing artificial intelligence and by analyzing the results of this artificial intelligence, it can learn something more about the human, how human maybe performs, or what is the, what is the, um, uh, what are the innate abilities of a human beings and how they solve these specific problems. And um, uh, here's the our view on visual reasoning. So the uh, one important thing that I want to uh, start right from the beginning is that we do not. There's a, this famous quote by Henry, Henry Poincaré who says mathematicians do not study objects, but relationships between the objects. And that pretty much summarizes everything that in, in how we approach the problems. Here are two examples of what the geometry problem is. On the left, I have um, a Raven progressive matrix uh, uh, example, and then here I have an odd one out. So uh, when you think about um, uh, objects themselves, we're gonna be thinking about the feature extraction. We're gonna say that we have uh, uh, squares and we have circles, we have uh, rhombus, and then the square is uh, dissected in four parts. And then there's the dark, um, uh, dark subsquare in one square. And then so you do a lot of this extraction to figure out like, what is it, what are we are looking for? That's like this very traditional um, uh, computational models to do the visual reasoning. And when we're thinking about the, uh, relationship between objects, we actually don't think about the, the, what the square or circle is. We think about it in terms of blobs. So we really think about what is the relationship between the, uh, the, all of the objects in the, all the blobs in the first row, what's the relationship between the, them in the column? What is the, and then we can start thinking it's like, oh, there's actually the dark areas tend to overlap in the column. Without knowing what it is, you kind of just say that there's, they seem to, seem to be like a common, uh, pattern, common strategy that, that we are, uh, that we as humans can pick up, and then do really care that that's the what kind of object it represents from the geometry perspective. Like, is it is it a circle? Is it a square or anything else? Uh, okay. Second, I think my slides are getting a little bit stuck. All right. So um, a while ago, we developed this structural affinity, um, structural affinity approach, where uh, we leaned on what other representations exist. Because before the representations, as I mentioned, they were about objects, um, what kind of edges we can detect, what we can do with them. And then uh, the question for us was like, can we actually do something different? Can we uh, quantify the interactions between uh, on the pixel levels? Can we do some abstractions based on that? Like, can we do some uh, pattern learning based on maybe specific heuristics and what kind of heuristics exist? And so what we, what we found on our first um, uh, type of test that we, that we approached this on, on the Raven progressive matrices, um, uh, we found the statistical reasoning was pretty sufficient uh, without the going into the, without knowing any details about the objects. It did pretty well. Uh, and uh, here's the, what in the one slide that exemplifies what the structural affinity even meant. 
Um, so it's the same, I put the same example of the Raven progressive matrix to a very simple test. So what here we're doing, we're trying to differ, extract different layers of, um, uh, of obstructions. And uh, what we can tell is that on the, on the, on the rows, there are specific blobs that are very similar. And then like we should identify that there's around the rows, there's, there's a similarity. Then we look into the across the columns because across, across the columns there's similarity. When we look into the um, in a diagonal or so triangular and all these different directions, we're trying to identify what is the what is the statistical pattern between them. And by looking into all, across multiple different statistical patterns, we can uh, start a reason on uh, on 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 what this thing what this rules means. Uh, surprisingly, these um, uh, heuristics they showed excellent result. And then when we look at further into, uh, into, into literature, uh, Carpenter just uh, talked about um, five different rules that are capturing how humans are solving these problems. And in this opportunity, they were indeed the rules that were that, that humans were looking for, they're looking for like across the rows, uh, columns, uh, and, 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 and in, in different places. Um, so quickly, the result on that, just to show that that's the, the result was um, uh, on a state of art. Uh, we managed to get the pretty high accuracy. Uh, that's the at the top bottom uh, image where so we have the, the Ravens progressive matrices is constructed of four different type of tests. We have B, C, D, and E, and it did very, very well on all of them. And then I've on a top left uh, image, I put different rules, so essentially saying like, what kind of explainability can we have about the uh, the, what structures were extracted. And then the, our computational model was able to say like, oh, well, there's the constant in the row, there's a distribution of three values in here, there's a additive quantity pairwise. Uh, and then I put here symmetry, which is pretty much a starter of the work that I'm, that I'm trying to present today, is that even at Ravens, um, I started noticing that there's something about uh, symmetry in these problems that could be, could be important, even though they were never mentioned in the, as actual, uh, as official rule in how these problems were solved, uh, one could observe that there is a symmetrical rule that can play a role. And, uh, uh, and then we started, we started going more into that direction. So um, before we now we dive into the, what, um, what we did for, uh, for the symmetry specifically on the upcoming test, there's a, uh, I wanna mention that there's a related work in this area in multiple different uh, fields. Uh, there is um, um, object detection when it does the traditional spatial analogy. There's a fractal reasoning, um, visual thinking. Uh, there's a visual analogy and the fine transformation, also part of the Georgia Tech Lab. And there's a neural network approaches. Um, what this and then there's a lot, a lot more. Uh, what this actually shows is that um, people do try to find multiple different representations, and then there's not one single representation that works the best. Uh, there's a they they depending on what problem people are solving, people find that the different um, uh, different obstructions tend to be capturing capturing the idea better. Okay, so uh, so our research questions. Uh, so as you probably like, I've been hinting a lot about that. We say what is what kind of abstract reasoning is the most relevant to be uh, under, to understand the geometric problem. So what transformations can we apply? What can we do uh, to these problems to be able to be able to address it? And, and further research question is, uh, is there an underlying organ organizing principle that governs our perception of shapes? And uh, the second one is like my favorite one because it dives into the, into the symmetry specifically. Um, and now our hypothesis is that symmetry is uh, a as is, is, or is the organizing principle in geometric intelligence, even when it's not directly involved. And uh, of course, I like, I'll put another quote of another mathematician who, uh, who talks, said this about the symmetry. Symmetry is what we see at the glance based on the fact that there is no reason for it to be any difference. So this is, it becomes very, very relevant to any geometrical test because you can view, uh, you can look at the image and if even no matter what the what the geometrical properties of that image is, you can uh, re, re represent it in terms of symmetry. Um, so so what does the symmetry has to do with the intelligence? So 
First of all, um, they would take a view that intelligence is not a skill to be mastered. Uh, and then what that means is that mastery means that, that a lot of skill, that means a lot, a lot of repetition. So you do things over and over, and then maybe you do the, uh, there's a volume, uh, which is where the deep learning uh, tends, tends to be very successful because they can uh, train uh, data sets on, train their, their artificial intelligence model on a lot of data. And uh, unfortunately for this task, we don't think that's necessarily the right approach because humans don't get to see um, uh, millions of examples to be able to solve this type of task. Excuse me. Oops. Sorry. So not, not, not aligned today. Like I have alarm to get ready for this. <laughs> uh, all right, excellent. So, uh, so because of, because of that, it's essentially the task that um, they, they, we can tackle with the big data. We have to be a little bit, um, uh, take a different abstraction, different, uh, different representation to see what we can do with a very, very limited amount of data. Pretty much from one example, can, can, uh, can artificial intelligence already try to figure out what the rules are what, what the, and how, how something can be solved. So the way we are defining uh, intelligence, actually we're not defining that there's a, definitions can be, can, be, uh, can be a lot. We're saying like one of the properties that, 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 um, uh, that matter for us is that it, we can, uh, the intelligence is the ability to efficiently order the observed facts. So it's all about like, what do you, what do you perceive and how we can structure what you see? And then um, based on what you, based on the order, based on the applied order, you can, um, you can, you can apply specific reasoning. And so there's um, uh, three different, pro the, you know, there's a workflow where there's a three distinct processes, the way we envision this. And there's a, first is decomposition and transformation. That's for any type of problem solving. Then there's an order and grouping. Uh, and then finally, there's alignment and reasoning. So if we say like, if we look into the symmetry, can the symmetry try to play a role in all three of these components? Uh, or like, the, it, could that be a goal for, um, uh, for, for origin destination by following these processes? Okay, so we decided to test the ideas. First of all, we test the ideas on the Raven progressive matrices, and now here we're testing it on, on uh, Dehane's data set. And uh, Dehane, uh, he conducted an experiment uh, where he, he questioned, um, is geometry an innate ability? Uh, and in other words, uh, if we uh, give the geometric intelligence test to uh, children who had education, uh, and we, we and they do the same test for people, for children who did not have access to education, uh, would the results be similar? And what he found that the results were indeed similar. So there was not really a, a significant culture difference. There is no um, uh, education difference, uh, which to him implied that uh, symmetry is uh, not symmetry, but the thing that the geometry uh, as, um, as um, ability itself is, uh, is pretty instinctual. And so that was, uh, that was, that was exciting. Uh, to, to, to learn. And uh, so we used all 45 of his tests to drive our artificial intelligence and uh, a model and then see what it can do. Okay, so here's the, uh, we can start with um, uh, decomposition part. So with the de decomposition part, uh, in this context, it's pretty straightforward. So the de decomposition is trying to break down the images into its components so we can do further grouping and ordering. Uh, and then here, just put the, on a, I put an example of a Raven's progressive matrices where I break it down in, in, um, in uh, with the, just with the regular, with the standard segmentation. And then I have the Dehane one on the right, uh, where it's also segmenting it. And then it, they, this is segmentation, automatic segmentation. So it's they, but because they, these, there's a, there's a clear separation between objects. This is not a, this is not a difficult task. It's pretty much any kind of tool can do that. And then the, but it doesn't have to be manual. Essentially, the, the, uh, the artificial intelligence can, 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 can separate these into groups and say these are different distinct tasks. And now after we did the segmentation, um, I, the, what is it that we wanted, wanted, we wanted to do with this? We want to bring the symmetry into play. And the way we want to do that, if we want to find that representation, the representation that I was talking about, and the best one is that um, that here we have, we applied a PCA. It's a principal component analysis, and uh, and what that does, it sort of unrotates uh, the images. 
So uh, the image here with lines, you can see the lines that are arranged along different axes because uh, that, that's, that's the way the test, test was meant to be. Um, the, the underlying geometry concept is not about the axis, right? It's not about the angle of the axis, what you can see here. What, what, we, 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 what we as a human see that there's, um, uh, what the concept is really testing is for um, the distance of the point from the line. And that's where you can see that the, the, in, in one of the, in a group of these images, the top um, left image is, is the odd one out that is, is, a, is a solution to the problem. And how long does that take to, takes to the human? Human would try to, to look into the vis uh, in uh, in the, um, um, on these lines, and then uh, maybe intuitively, and then see the answer right away. Uh, but what did they do? What's the mental process that happens there? Did they annotate um, uh, all of their lines in their mind? And then uh, our hypothesis is, yeah, maybe that does happen. So when we apply the PCA, um, like what this is what happens to the to the lines, right? So they get all annotated. And, uh, and then so we can see that there's a specific now that there's a, there's a repetition that we are looking for. And then we are, uh, for it, it set us up beautifully for the next step when we're trying to identify the, we do the order and the grouping. And then the grouping in this case is gonna be, we need to group all of the images which are similar uh, and then group the images which are not similar, which, which, which violate the concept. And so the, uh, just by visual uh, inspection, we already see that um, uh, it's it's highlighting the uh, one of the images, um, left bottom all, all of the images. So we, after we did the uh, realignment, it says like oh one of the one of these particular images is does not seem to be uh, fitting very well in the entire group. And because PCA here is so important, I wanted to take a look at one more example which is a little bit more, not as straightforward as lines. Uh, they, uh, here we have some specific blob and, and then why that one is beautiful as well, because this is not a specific um, a geometry shape anymore. You can't really think about this as squares or circle. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a shape. Uh, and if in that shape, um, if we stare at it for a bit, we will be able to see that there's, um, um, that some, one of the images standing out is, does not fit into the rest of the group. And you kind of have to a little bit tilt your head here and there to, to align yourself and to see that when, when does that happen. Um, but it, it is much, much easier after you do the video presentation with PCA. After we did the transformation, now it becomes very clear uh, of which images tend to be group, grouping themselves uh, by being very similar and which one isn't. So uh, if you denoise yourself from the, all of the unnecessary feature, in this case, unnecessary feature is the axis, how the things are aligned. It becomes uh, uh, straightforward to see that what the solution is. Um, so what, what we're actually saying is that the PCA allows you to focus the attention on the more salient features. Um, and and is it, it's possible that what, uh, when, the, when the humans are looking at the, the problems, they are, um, the first is the evaluation is that what are the features, which ones are important, which ones are not. And it's not doing the order like estimating by each feature and then see which feature. Um, uh, um, we, it's not considering, in other words, every single feature available in the image, but it's, it's very selective on what's important. Um, uh, and then uh, one more really with, with the circles and why I wanna, wanna just stress out that um, symmetry is important here because um, the, if uh, now as a human, we're looking at the circles and we wanna identify which circle uh, violates some, some geometry concept that is being presented in the image. We can say like maybe it's it's the size of the black circle, uh, maybe it's the position of the black circle. Uh, it's not it's not entirely clear right away, and after the applying that transformation, um, it becomes very clear. It becomes very clear that now you have a um, uh, one of the circles includes a um, uh, a black a, a white circle in the middle, which is not fitting. Um, it, it, which which is not fit into the into the uh, into the style of the rest of the images, which kind of breaks uh, breaks the overall pattern. Okay, and uh, so that was on uh, the uh, on the decomp on the um, uh, transformation, the transformation that was setting us setting us up for the uh, for the next phase. 
So here's like go, go, going back a little bit at the at what features are um, important when we look at the geometry problems. And I just listed a few, uh, the ones available at Dehane's uh, task. So there's a geometric transformation when we talk about translation reflections. There's a geometry overall, how the lines are um, uh, aligned together. There's a topology, there's orientation, there's geometric figures. So if you are to really approach this task um, um, I, from feature engineering uh, uh, direction, uh, you have to enumerate all the possible uh, geometry uh, concepts that, 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 that you know or it has to be included into your database and start crafting up these features. What does it, what does the orientation mean? What does the topology mean? What's, what, what are do, what is the, what are the properties of geometric figures? What is it in geometry and all these different things? And, uh, and then what the suggestion is that we actually don't necessarily have to, as going back now to the, one of the simpler um, images. Um, after this, after the transformation, what we're going to do, we're going to just score different type of symmetries. So that, uh, and then the simple symmetries are the vertical symmetry, horizontal symmetry, some rotational symmetry, so some reflections. So just not basic these estimations, we can say like, okay, so um, let's hypothetically say that the vertical symmetry on uh, on uh, uh, upper images were in uh, around uh, in high 90s. Um, and it means like we, we kind of squish the image in half and then um, is, is image um, um, and folds us in itself. And it's pretty much does, you can say like, oh, everything is around 97, 95, 98%. And we can say that one of the images, uh, the vertical symmetry here is 40%. And if, they, if, uh, if the vertical, um, if vertical symmetry on this one is 40%, and then that means that that is a quantitative measure for why, for how we can qualify that this image is out of, um, out of the grouping that we have. So we can have with a high level of confidence, we can say that the image um, um, with the dot out of the line is, is the anomaly one. And uh, the final process here is alignment and scoring. So I just showed an example on uh, vertical symmetry, but uh, there are like other symmetry features that, um, that you can essentially collect multiple, uh, all these different symmetry features and then you can apply them to decompose the images and start scoring them. And then see on average, which image tends to have the lowest score. And the image with the lowest score is a, is a solution. Uh, they, uh, and then the, uh, I'll talk about the explainability of that a little bit better. Excuse me. Okay, um, so um, it, what, what, what this one allows us is not just look, identify um, which image is violating the geometry principle, it's actually educating you like why. Doesn't just give you a score, but says like, ah, I scored low on, on this particular symmetry, on that particular symmetry, on that particular symmetry. And then you can look, look back and then uh, uh, analyze the, the image and then see what, why image, what kind of, why symmetry work there in what way. And it gives you, uh, allows you um, another explainability teaching moment that is, uh, like we believe is missing in a lot of uh, artificial intelligence models this day, that um, something just spits out the answer for you without necessarily explaining uh, why, why something is such. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna say much on this slide. This is just a, a workflow of the entire model that I walk you through. When we, we start with the image and then we segment them, we do the visual encoding, we represent the features, select the features, and then find out which ones um, which ones is violating and we identify that one as odd. This is just to more give a more overall um, uh, view on, on what the things are. So, um, so how did it do? It actually did uh, really, really well um, with, uh, given that it did not know anything about the objects, did not do any object detection, did not know what the squares were, what the rectangles, what the rhombus, um, did not know what the, um, uh, what the metrics, what the Euclidean metrics were, um, with uh, just symmetrical features. Um, so uh, column, third column ratio there, 
is um, how many um, uh, were correctly identified by the model. So it's like, let's say 100% like on um, uh, for six type of features, yes. Uh, and uh, what is even more interesting for, in these results though, is that um, it tends to be um, aligned with uh, performance on the human as well. Aligned meaning the direct directionally. So um, last three features, metric properties, geometric transformation and chiral figures um, um, are very low in score, but they're low in score for humans as well. And uh, the results were that it's the geometric transformation uh, is, is a property that is dynamic uh, in its nature. And because it's dynamic, humans have a harder time um, envisioning uh, what the transformation really needs to happen. Uh, there's a similar, uh, similar challenge in the metric properties and chiral figures, and I'm going to go in a little bit into that. Um, but it, it, it is, it is, it's certainly aligned. And uh, that was encouraging for us because we wanted to, um, thinking back on that dual nature, our task was to be able to go to go both ways, not just to design a model uh, that does well, <laughs> does well, meaning the reaches like reaches ninety percent. We wanted to see like would that uh, would be able to explain some of the uh, uh, would that be able to be aligned? Would be able to explain something on um, how humans how humans um, uh, are solving it, and then we'll be able to tell us something about it. Okay, and um, so I want to go to the challenge just a little bit. Um, so the symmetry features that I've talked about, they're not automatically discovered, meaning that these are the heuristics that have to be um, encoded into the artificial intelligence tool. So it means you have to um, say that I, I that here's my feature I'm looking for horizontal symmetry. This is what this is what you're looking for. Um, but the good news is that the symmetry features are finite. Uh, it's not like they're going to have like an unlimited amount of different things. So they, and then they have rather simple, you say like, I need to horizontally reflect, uh, uh, vertically reflect, a uh, reflector on this one and this one and that one. Uh, so that's not, uh, it's not, it's not too bad. Um, sometimes the VPCA transformation may be a little bit too helpful, too helpful as in, um, the, the goal of the transformation is to remove the unnecessary information, remove the information that maybe adds noise. Uh, but this noise could have, could have actually been a relevant information. So it's very possible that in uh, some in some cases that does happen, and it does happen in chirality cases. And uh, chirality is that it is a specific property that um, that actually does not have a symmetry. The way the way it 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 it, it is. The way it's rotated and shaped, uh, if you retransform it, the symmetry feature in itself disappears. So, uh, so it's it's even it, it reinstated the hypothesis we were following. So we like the idea that it was um, uh, breaking on chirality. Well, didn't sort of like it, but it was um, it was somewhat almost expected that that's going to happen. Um, and another challenge that um, uh, the geometrical concepts such as topology. Um, they might not have necessarily like the easiest um, uh, interpretation in terms of symmetry, but they, but it's still possible because the symmetry is not just a uh, a transformation; it's not just reflection or rotation. Um, symmetry can be uh, can be viewed as a as an image as a whole. If you look at the, all of the images and then you do permutation of the objects after permit, permuting of the objects, is that do you, are you still getting the same um, uh, the same result? And if that if, if that's happening, then then uh, then 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 the symmetry is preserved. It's slightly harder to interpret, but it's still it's still definitely uh, possible. Okay, so um, and then here's the actual like, the chirality figure that I was uh, that I was mentioning. I actually put it in place. Um, we have here the concept uh, and, and that humans need to identify which which of these images on the left is is um, um, is an odd one out, um, and then uh, after <laughs> tilting again your head several times, uh, you, one will be able to identify it, right? So this the well, I'm actually lost it myself again now. Where we are on that one? 
yeah, it's it's the all the way on the on the on the right. That's that, that is not the right um, symmetry. But when the PCA is being uh, applied, um, you can see they're all identical. They're all identical because the PCA did the did the you know, transformation maybe a little bit too aggressively, saying like, oh, there's like we see we just look pretty much the same, uh, uh, which is lost the concept. Um, uh, but uh, the other, other essential, if we, if, we, if we are to say like this is not necessarily about virality, but overall, does this capture, does this try to bring um, the information, um, does this try to highlight the information? Yeah, PCA does, uh, uh, does, does, does help, uh, help with that. And then I put the out question here at the beginning to just to say like, is there a specific, um, uh, what kind of abstract uh, reasoning uh, is relevant, and we can say that the uh, um, PCA is going to be um, uh, identifying that geometry concept for us in most of the cases uh, uh, where where that's possible, and where that's not possible, it's not even possible for humans as well. I mean, not possible. It's the humans I have, have a challenge with that as well. Um, and uh, that our conclusion too from the paper uh, is that um, symmetry is governing a lot of these uh, principles and it's considered a latent, uh, latent principle. So going back to the circles, um, there's the, the original concept is, is not about the symmetry. Original concept is about the distance um, of a dot uh, from, the, um, um, uh, from the circumference. And uh, that's what is being tested on the humans. And uh, when we say that, well, they, we don't have to, we don't really, if we forget about that, that's the metric we want to try to capture, we're going to say, well, we need to present this in terms of a symmetry and uh, score each image on its, on its symmetrical properties and identify the one image that is the uh, uh, um, least appealing uh, from from my perspective, and and that is a problem solved. Meaning that's that 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 is our solution. Okay. Uh, so why is it symmetry significant? Um, well, so the, in one of the my favorite another mathematician George Poulin, he said that the symmetry is tightly connected to inductive reasoning and problem solving. So it's again he highlighted as one of the most important. Um, as um, um, I wouldn't say skills important, uh, uh, in, um, characteristics of intelligence in humans, if you're able to manipulate um, objects um, and then identify um, symmetrical aspects of what you're looking at. Uh, Gishtol theories um, suggest that the human brain does use repetition, translation, and rotation to, to perceive the visual information. So rather than reasoning in terms of um, v square, um, has the same properties as v square. Uh, it's really just like about the taking the one square, moving it over, and realigning with the other, and then sort of like, oh, this seems to be the same. Uh, uh, and then we don't need the knowledge of of, of the concept of the square. And uh, what what is uh, appealing to us is that among many amongst many representations that we have tried um, for this type of intelligence test. We find that uh, symmetry is a pretty powerful as feature on itself uh, without bringing any other heuristics. In our uh, prior efforts with the radiant progressive matrices, um, or when, when I showed in the slides before, when we had uh, rules about the constant in a row, constant in, um, in a column, uh, or how, what are the objects in the diagonal, we applied various heuristics to be trying to tra capture some of the relationship, how some of the transformations between the figures, but they were not necessarily all symmetry. And, and then now we're taking a step further, we're saying like, can we actually do everything just, uh, all of that just in terms of symmetry? And because we keep talking about symmetry and symmetry, uh, what is we want to do next? Um, I alluded earlier that there's a just like limited amount of symmetry features that, that, you, that you really need to concern yourself with. And uh, in George Polia's work um, uh, in, on crystallography, he identified 17 uh, groups, distinct groups, and I have a, an image at the top. So there's different, different types of the groups that you can essentially encode all of those. Uh, that should be all set in terms of what kind of symmetry you are interested in. And uh, there's uh, um, MC Escher 
he did a lot of work inspired from uh, on that symmetry. He would start with a geometrical problem, and uh, all of his figures would be um, uh, would be would be ex exemplifying um, one or the other type of symmetry. So like, okay, I'm going to do a deflection. I'm going to do a translation. I'm going to do the um, uh, uh, some 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 lateral movements and. Uh, Escher himself used that as a teaching um, uh, uh, te teaching concepts uh, in in the geometry classes, and then he thought that was uh, that allowed uh, a pretty good explainability of what of what the feature or the feature actually means. And uh, what we want to do further, um, we wanted to generalize this concept now even even a lot further than just or even progressive matrices in the Hain task. Um, there's a um, um, different visual perceptions such as background, background foreground, um, where uh, there's a lot of optical illusions where you look at the image and they don't necessarily know um, uh, which to focus on. Uh, so like a lot of images from Gödel Eshabahi, people are familiar with that, with that work, it has, um, uh, which is kind of inspired looking in that direction to begin with. And then there's a Bongar problem, which also requires some explainability uh, to be able to look into the, look into the geometry and of the problem and explain um, uh, explain what is what is different, uh, what makes something what makes them something more significant than the other. Uh, and then uh, we always are doing working on this in this direction. Uh, it's a lot more challenging than expected, but it's uh, um, and then it dis distillations that um, uh, what I exemplified here on the right side the actual images. Uh, they are very visually pleasing, and uh, if we can identify, kind of break it down, uh, what this distillation and what the motif, what the, what is the motif in these distillations, and after we identify what the motif is, um, you can uh, start like realigning that and so like this is this is this is what kind of symmetry captured I in this image. This this ones are in here and here, and uh, they're just like adds to the. Um, 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 artistic appreciation of the of the art itself. All right, and, I, and I'm done and I managed to through. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna Thank stop. you so much for a great talk. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, so I see there's a question in the chat, but I also see you have your uh, hand raised. So please, you can go ahead. Yes, I actually have uh, two questions. The first is just in the in the chat. I, I mentioned the uh, work of uh, Andrew Lovett and Ken Forbes, who have modeled both of these data sets, Ravens and the <clears throat> the Han uh, Spelke work. And, and I mean, they have somewhat similar goals, but a very different theoretical perspective where they use analogy and things. I don't know if you've, you've thought I about. Yes, uh, we actually do compare our work to uh, Forbes and Lovett uh, in both cases. And in case of Raven progressive matrix and in case of Dehane task. And in both cases, we are um, on par exactly with them on, on the performance. Uh, uh, but our representation is, is very, very different uh, with yeah. the, you know, the object detection on the edge. Um, uh, the lab is very um, set in the mind that uh, humans, the only way humans perceive objects is in defined edges. Uh, and, and then we're trying to prove that that's uh, maybe not the only way. And uh, so far, I think we've been successful saying that this, this is without knowing anything about objects, without uh, re-encoding what, um, what the rules should have been, uh, we can still uh, um, arrive to a solution. And we can arrive to a solution with explanation of what is the underlying structure that exists there. Okay, my other question is a little more abstract and that is, what do your results, what implications do they have or your interpretation for the original claims of the Dahan paper that geometry is, you know, like an innate skill or I, I don't, do you see any alignment with that claim or do you, where, where do your results leave that claim? Uh, yes, uh, we definitely narrowed, we pushed that down even further. We're saying not just geometry uh, in general, uh, symmetry is what is what people are, are driving for. It's like in this particular uh, paper, we say that uh, Dehane studied with um, geometry is an innate um, uh, skill. And we're saying like, oh, well, 
even further, symmetry is organizing principle of that geometry. And then uh, symmetry is what people are um, I, um, born with, the skill that we can perceive the symmetry the best. Uh, we can um, understand if something um, is, is reflective in consider saying this, the image is very self-similar. And um, a lot of digital theories are supporting that idea that um, is that we just generally like to, um, it seems like symmetry, symmetry adds simplicity. And uh, we as a humans, we like that simplicity is pleasing. It's not overwhelming our brains. So if there's something to be solved, if you look at the, at the geometric image, um, maybe trying to calculate the distance between the curves or looking if something is parallel or not, you know, doing all the different things requires a little bit more, more mental effort. And you can do a lot of that with just intuition by assessing is like, is these kind of things in the same ballpark as these kind of thing? And it uh, helps, um, helps you get ahead of a line. And um, uh, Polya said that that's, that definitely is a sign of, um, of intelligence when, when humans are um, uh, applying this mental, mental heuristics of symmetry to evaluate what the problem is. And sometimes they would go further after they did the initial assessment, they would say, like, oh, now I can actually eliminate all of their unnecessary information and I'm going to focus on what is, what is the next thing I need to do. But it, it helps with, um, uh, with organization first. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. I do see that there's one more uh, question, but um, in the interest of time to make sure that there's enough of a break before posters, I think we're going to have to wrap up here. Um, although um, perhaps you'd be open to um, emails or messages from anyone else who might have additional questions. Absolutely. Great. So um, please, everyone, uh, join me in thanking all three of our excellent speakers today um, on their very uh, interesting, for their very interesting talks. Um, and um, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for attending and asking questions. Thank you. It was a great session. Uh, so I believe we have a 10 minute break now until uh, 20 to the full hour when the poster session starts. <laughs>